Welcome to the second in the 1991 lecture series by the Bishop Hill Heritage Association. Tonight we're going to be hearing from Verla Rylander Hunter, who is our herbalist in the Heritage Craft Program. I wondered a few years ago, but it's been about three years ago now, when Ray Pearson passed away, who was going to pick up the thread of Bishop Hill and Pleasant Hill. And it turns out that we're going to be hearing some uh, about that this evening from Verla. She's been finding some interesting things. She's been getting into the Heritage Archive and uh, maneuvering around in that and finding some very interesting things for you tonight. Uh, a Bishop Hill Herbal. Thank you. <coughs> Everyone else can join me and cough twice and shuffle three times. If you can't hear, move up because I can't raise the voice tonight. Uh, I was hoping that Ron Nelson would be here this evening. I don't see him. This all started for me a number of years ago when Dina Nelson, the late Dina Nelson and I were discussing the possibility of herbs being used in some manner or form in the Bishop Hill Colony. And Ron said, my people don't do herbs. They never did, they never will. And um, from one bullheaded sweep to the other, that was just like a challenge. And um, so over the years, I've picked up bits and pieces. It isn't the uh, herbal background that you find in the Shaker villages, but they used herbs uh, quite often against their own better judgment, but they did use herbs. Uh, in order to give myself a little bit of a benefit of the doubt, I want to expand on what herbs are tonight. We have to make sure that we're all talking about the same thing. Uh, herbs are a very vague term. For one thing, it is not a plant. It is the usage of a plant. Uh, herbs can be the stem, the root, the leaves, the berries, uh, seed pods or seeds from any plant as long as a person finds a use for it. Now a spice, on the other hand, is the same thing, except it grows in the tropics. Herbs grow in the temperate zone. Um, the southern United States bought a tremendous amount of herbs from the Pleasant Hill Shakers because they couldn't grow herbs in the south. And so the Pleasant Hill Shakers realized early on that they had quite a market there with their own boats. They could take their own flat bottom boats straight out onto the Ohio River and head south. And they had a big market in the south for their herbs. So we can't pigeonhole or build a fence around what herbs are. Uh, Corsican mint is only a quarter of an inch tall. It's an herb. If we go out and make use of an oak tree, take the bark from the slippery elm, the leaves, the acorns, or nuts, then that draws that huge tree into our herb garden. So it, it expands what we use. Um, they've come down over the centuries, each generation and each century, the herb and the herb technology has changed. So what might have been an herb back 500 years ago is no longer considered an herb and won't be found in the herbal books today. In the 1500s, German botanists described new discoveries in the herb world, which included corn, snap beans, and marigolds. The Elizabethans uh, never separated their gardens. They put herbs, flowers, and vegetables all in the same garden, called it a kitchen garden. The next thing up was that kitchen gardens became herb gardens. 
A group of Swedes landed in America in the 1600s, and the first thing they did was to establish the new Sweden colony. Um, they built a rough structure of a lean-to, which they made a home. The second thing they did was to put in a herb garden. The garden contain, uh, contained beans and parsnips. Parsnips, over many generations, have been included in the herb gardens and have been used both as a vegetable and a medicinal. Excuse me. Anyone that cares to join me in sipping coffee tonight, <laughs> I'll go right ahead. Originally, herbs were gathered in the wild. If a man was hungry and went out and ate a plant and he didn't get sick or died, then he listed that as a culinary. Uh, the same way if a uh, man was sick or injured, they would treat him with a particular plant. If he lived, then that was a medicinal. If he died, then they just looked for a different plant the next time. <laughs> Over the years, they began to realize that certain plants seemed to help or cure a particular affliction. And so that particular herb would be listed sometimes by word of mouth, sometimes by witch doctor, down from one generation to the next as an herbal cure for that particular affliction. So herbal medicine evolved over many generations by trial and error and superstition. A great deal of superstition and mysticism belongs in the world of herbs. In the uh, Middle Ages, witches started the rumor that they could fly. And to this day, we celebrate Halloween with a witch on a broom flying, right? Okay, that has concrete evidence in herbs. The witch would, um, uh, the witches all lived in their own little hut in the settlement. And they would make an ointment. They would add uh, nightshade and monk's hood along about late afternoon to the ointment. They'd let it brew in the pot. And about dark, they'd get in front of the fire and strip down and grease their entire bodies with this ointment. Now, nightshade and monk's hood are both deadly poisonous. Uh, they have the ability to be absorbed through the skin and into the bloodstream. So during the night, everybody in the settlement would hear the witches scream and cackle, first over on one side and then the other, all night long, all through. They knew something terrible was going on. Nobody could be in that many places at once. So the next morning, they go, got together, and they all went up to the witch's house, pounded on the door. <coughs> she staggers up off the floor, grabs her broom to have something to hang on to, puts something around her neck, opens the door and says, what do you want? They said, what in the world were you doing last night? Well, I tied one on, and I was really flying. But she was. <laughs> These two drugs together would be enough to make her think that knock her out and she would actually hallucinate that she'd been flying all night long. They heard her screaming and yelling, running all streaking through the entire settlement, so they believed she was flying. <laughs> and you follow a great deal of not only Halloween customs, but a great many customs that have their birth in herbs and how people use them. Um, Quite often, uh, just a little bit too much, or she licked her fingers and got a little bit too much. She'd take a flight, but she'd never land, and they'd find her dead in her cabin the next morning. But this was typical of the Middle Ages, great deal of superstition and mysticism. Uh, tonight, I want to check out herbs that were used not only by the Bishop Hill colonists, but by the American Indians that lived in this area at that time, <coughs> by the pioneers, and especially by the mid-1800 medical doctors. Orthodox medicine in this country was extremely aggressive. Typically, it consisted of um, massive doses of poisons, violent purges, and even bleeding. Doctors wanted something big to happen. They wanted something very dramatic. 
our mental image of the mid-century doctors were that they uh, come in the middle of the night, took care of the patient, and at dawn left with a chicken and a quart of peaches. And that's kind of a naive concept. Doctors were ambitious too. They were in a new country, and everybody that entered the United States during that time thought they were going to get rich, doctors included. <laughs> the American Indian was considerably less dramatic than doctors. Uh, he had been living with plants for generations. The movement of tribes from one season to the next quite often would be to follow the streams where the plants grew. And we've heard about winter quarters and spring quarters and summer quarters with, <coughs> excuse me, with Indians. But quite often it was their effort to find pot herbs along the springs and along the streams in the springtime and then into the timbers in the late summer and fall for the nuts and berries. Herbs were a major staple of their diet. If you couldn't find buffalo, you could always go into the woods and pick berries and nuts and find fresh plants. Herbs constituted almost their entire medical supply and they also used them for ceremonial use. Potions were made um, to protect you from your enemies. Good luck charms were made from herbs to go fishing or hunting with. Love potions were made to make the strongest squaw in the tribe fall in love with you. The Bishop Hill College could have learned a great deal from local Indians. Um, the pioneers came into Red Oak in 1832. And just a year after that, there was um, a big conference in Chicago. Uh, the government had had a hard time getting people to move into Illinois because of the Indians. Black Hawk had a very colorful reputation, and people were terrified of the Indians. There isn't much as to <coughs> Indian connections with Bishop Hill. I think uh, the one painting that Kranz did showed uh, a confrontation with an Indian uh, that had been hired to come in and scalp <coughs> Eric Jansen. But I found two other instances in the uh, Stoneberg papers. Uh, there were Indians on the government island at Rock Island, and people were sent there to fish. They were sent with a few days' supply of food, a uh, cow hooked onto the back of the wagon, and they were told not to come home until they had enough fish to feed the whole group here. One group went up that contained a couple of young women, and when one of the women went out to the spring to get water in the evening, she was confronted with a dozen Indians wrapped in nothing but a blanket. They terrified her. Uh, they did not try to harm her in any way, but the Bishop Hill colonists did not try to contact the Indians. <coughs> this one I love. Once there was a number of Indians with beautiful necklaces and nice garbs who paraded in single file through Bishop Hill, presumably on their way to a conference. When you'd love to see the faces around here. In 1850, when a group of Indians paraded down Main Street, Bishop Hill. Uh, but the Indians were forced out of Illinois by the government in 1833. A few stayed, small pockets that said, no, I don't want to go, my daddy grew up here. Stayed out in the woods, uh, and they, they did communicate back and forth with the white man. Uh, the pioneers in Red Oak uh, befriended the Indians in 1832 and become friends with a number of them. There was an old Indian chief that used to spend quite a bit of time with the pioneers out there. And whenever Black Hawk would go on a rampage, he would come and warn them. He also went into the woods with them and helped them to pick nuts and berries and told them where they could find food. So there was a small group that stayed in uh, and, and helped the pioneers to make life a little easier to begin with. 
Our present day use of earth are so much different that it's hard for us to contemplate the things they used then. We use herbs primarily for seasonings. Uh, the plants are cultivated in pots or in neat little herb gardens. We use them decoratively for crafts or as accents in our life. They're simply an enhancement to our life. Um, later this evening, we'll talk for a few minutes about the new herbal medicinals that are coming on the market. But tonight, I want to get into basically three things, and that's medicinal herbs, culinary herbs, and decorative herbs. Uh, touch lightly on the Illinois Indians and the pioneers, and then move on to the Bishopville colony. Before the white man took over the land and developed it, there was approximately 10% of the land in this region was taken up by nut trees, nuts and acorns, 20% by fruit trees, where a lot of wild plum, wild cherry, dewberry, blackberry, and grapes. Indians gathered these, as well as a number of pot herbs, such as amaranth, purslane, folk wheat, carpet weed, and sorrel. They also cultivated corn, beans, and tobacco. Watermelon had been introduced into the United States in the 16th century and was used by many Indians across the country. This one book gets into hundreds of medicinals and culinary herbs that were used by Indians in Illinois. They depended on it. It was their lifestyle. Uh, Chris Brony did a survey out here, just the edge of town, on ground that belonged to, belongs to Brian Potter, approximately three acres. And Chris run this checklist from 1987 through 1988. He recorded six natural prairie grasses. This is on virgin soil out here. And 32 different plants. And he kept track of them, and, and they're still there. Those are listed in this book, as well as hundreds more. Um, a lot of them are medicinal herb plants that were used by the pioneers and were used by the Indians. In 32, Red Oak um, was uh, settled by three families. At first, they were terrified. This was a year before the Chicago Treaty. But one of the group convinced the rest of them that they should try to befriend the Indians. Um, I think the, one of the nicest things I've read in the archives, and this one comes from the Knox archives, Silver Papers, and it was uh, his interview of one young woman who was only six years old when she came into Illinois, and she tells the entire story. He wrote 44 pages, and I don't think it's ever been published. Uh, I haven't seen it published anyway. And she gives a complete description of how they built their log cabin and how they existed that first year. I'll read just a few excerpts from it. Our coffee was parched wheat. Our tea was red root leaves dried. Now that could be the herb New Jersey tea. It could also be uh, one of four ginseng roots that uh, were wild in this area. Our sugar was made from the sap of hard maple trees. Potatoes and vegetables were plentiful, and with milk and butter, our living was not bad. There was lots of bees, and with honey, and with the game that I've spoken of before, life wasn't too bad. We picked wild fruit and berries, which we dried and preserved for winter use. So with the large vegetables that this new fertile soil would produce, you can see our living was good. Before the Indian War was over, the people were afraid to go out into their sugar camps to make sugar. Uh, they would let part of their pumpkins freeze. They would put the pumpkins in barrels and leach them off as they did lye with their soap. Then they took that juice and made molasses, and some unfrozen pumpkins were used to make pumpkin butter. Have you ever heard molasses made out of pumpkin juice? 
They opened the sugar camps once the Indians left. The buckets were wooden troughs and the fills were made of sumac with a pitch burned out and the center was a hot iron. One spring, I remember my father and uncle made three barrels of lovely sugar from this sap, lots of molasses, and when the sap was not good enough for molasses anymore, they made the best of vinegar from it, and I've not heard of maple vinegar either. We made our starch of potatoes and wheat bran by wetting it and letting the starch settle and dry. We made linen cloth, which was durable as well as cool in the summer, and homespun woolen cloth was very durable. Woolen homespun cloth was very durable and warm for winter wear. They dyed it with walnut bark for a light brown, and they used the hulls for a dark brown, and yellow bark. Um, dyed some in a yellow bark and then dipped into indigo blue to make a green. So herbal dyes, all of them. We put up molasses, vinegar, and meat by the barrel. And we did all of this ourselves. The first two years, now this was 1932, the first two years we were almost alone in Red Oak Grove, there being only two other families. But soon settlers began to come thick and fast, and then we had lots of good neighbors. There are lots of good neighbors would have been um, the Bishop Hill group. This little girl who was six when she moved over here had um, six sisters and brothers. Black Hawk made one attack and took two of the little girls, kidnapped them. Uh, the settlers got together and went after them and got them back. So they didn't have an easy life, but uh, she lost her mother when uh, she was quite young. The mother died from hiding out in the woods during the freezing rain, uh, hiding from Black Hawk. So life wasn't great for them, but they did all right. And following uh, the next 10 to 15 years, they kind of settled in. They knew how to live off of the land. That first year, they knew the most important thing. They knew that you had to have adequate cover, healthy food, and you had to stay strong and healthy throughout that first year. Um, they knew how to survive. You can't help but wonder what they thought of the new people in the neighborhood. They talked funny. They all looked alike. And they seemed to be going hell-bent for election for God knows what. They didn't seem to have survival in mind that first year. But Eric Jansen had a big thing going. He had a goal, a big goal. It was to establish a new Jerusalem to which all the people of the world would come. That's a big job. And the people believed it too. He had convinced everyone that their place was here to build a new world, not just in a new country, not just a new city, but a city which would bring all the world in. I've heard the remark made so often that Bishop Hill was a closed society. He did try to keep outside influences away from the colonists, but he told the colonists from the beginning that they were coming here to build a new Jerusalem and that they were to seek out all the people of the world and save them because the millennium was at hand and those that weren't saved would be destroyed by God. So it was their duty on this earth to save the world. How do you get all of these people work this hard, you have to have one heck of a plan, and you had a good one. Here's the goal. We need three big things here. We need land, lots of land. Now, the Pleasant Hill Shakers only had 6,500 acres of land. They were quite content with it. 
they had been in existence and been very successful for a very long time before the Bishop Hill colony started. But in a very short few years, what was it? Bishop Hill acquired some 13,000 acres, was it? In a very few years. So they wanted land. They wanted industry in order to make money, and they wanted facilities in order to house all the people that would be coming here to be converted. Well, Eric was a good businessman. That means we've got to have sales. Got to have a lot of sales in order to buy land, set up industries, and build facilities for the New Jerusalem. Well, any good businessman knows that when this figure, it doesn't matter where this figure's at, it's where this figure is in relationship to the sales. This is the debit side. This is overhead. This we've got to keep clear down here. And they did a job. His plan is what I call three cents a day. That's less than $11 a year. That's what they plan to spend on each person for overhead. These people work 12, 16, 18 hours a day. There's no written agreement, no contract. They left, they left empty handed. They had to use everything. Everyone handed in everything they owned. Um, the Forsyth people from the parish of Forsyth had the most silk kerchiefs. A good country woman in Sweden should have a dozen silk handkerchiefs. These were turned in because so many mothers were working in the fields. <clears throat> Older women and young girls were told to keep the kids, take care of them until mama gets back to nurse them. Well, kids are going to yell and scream and holler and wants to be taken care of. I couldn't run down to the store and pick up a pacifier. So they collected all of the silk kerchiefs, filled them with maple sugar, and gave them to the babies in, in 1849 as sugar tips. This is from Mrs. H. Lindenwall. So if you go through a great grandmother's trunk and you find a silk kerchief, you shouldn't sell it around. It means your grandma was holding out. <laughs> and so he, but he did. He had all of them. And then the colonists preached themselves. Now this is an interview with a colonist. That Bishop Hill was to be the city to which all people were to come. That it was a chosen city. <clears throat> and so they worked with the future in mind to build up a strong and prosperous place. That means they willingly worked 12 to 18 hours a day, and that's why they sang all the way home. Because in this new Jerusalem, what would they be once the whole world came here? They would be top dog. They would be the leaders. They would be God's chosen people. But the first year was a little tough. Um, I found a bill in the archives here in Bishop Hill. It's made it's beautiful old script. Pen and ink. It's made out to Eric Jansen, proprietor of the Sweet Colony, in account with Joseph Height. Uh, it begins on January 18, 1849. 28 ounce bottles of sulfur grapes. A half a pound of capsium. Capsium is an herb. It is red hot pepper powder. Three pounds of licorice. Fourteen pounds of brown sugar. A half a gallon of turpentine was only 50 cents. Now this is a medicinal. Uh, but he charged him 75 cents for the bottle to put it in. Three and three-fourths pounds of gum of myrrh. A glass mortar. A quarter of a pound of hemlock. Uh, four ounces of oxalic acid, two ounces of tart amnic, that is to force vomiting, three pounds of sienna, and a pound of jalo. Then he charged him 25 cents for the box to put the stuff in. This was in January when so many of them were sick in the caves. Uh, they were dying, they were dragging at least one out a day. Uh, 
They had come over, had a hard trip. They'd been fasting during the winter because of the lack of food. Very poor diet and uh, probably no fruit whatsoever. So when they became, began getting sick uh, after the first few bits, they called this doctor in to help with the, the local colony doctor. <clears throat> I remember I said that mid-1800 doctors were radicals. They liked to see something really wild go on. And, and this would have been something wild, especially a lot of these people had diarrhea to begin with. And these are all purges. I took this list in and showed it to a pharmacist, and I told him what physical condition the colonists were in when they were given this stuff. And I asked him, I said, what, what do you think this would do? And he says, oh, I think it'd finish every one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so perhaps we need to take a more optimistic view it's not how many died during that first winter, it's the miracle that someone lived. <laughs> uh, he was called back in again in February, and uh, in March, he, he got friendly in March, he brought them a pound of chamomile, which cost 40 cents. And you want to realize that all of this, that first January, that was $48 for medication. And that's raising havoc with these two. We've got to keep this down, and, and spending $48 for medication for those people isn't going to do it. I'll pass some of these things around. So you, and if you pass them around, uh, you can dump them out in your hand and, and feel it. Don't take anything. I don't have a license <laughs> to practice. But you can smell it and, and sprinkle some in your hand if you like. Try it. Uh, but he also brought them a bottle of tonic, which would have helped. So anybody that lived through January's medication uh, could pick up on a tonic and some chamomile, chamomile tea in March. Tea is what they would have made from this. It definitely is a herb. It's very soothing to the stomach. It's one of the healthy things. Now they didn't. This guy cost a lot, so they didn't call him back very often. But they did call him back in August. And this time, it was the stuff he brought was even worse. We called him August 19th, the 25th, the 27th, and 29th. He brought morphine, camphor, opium in sugar lead pills. Uh, he ground prescriptions, which he doesn't specify what they were, for 15 different patients the first day, and as six to eight each day after that. On August 27th, he brought in 34 pounds of rice and sack. Even if we didn't know um, what happened in Bishop Hill in August and September of that year, just from this prescription, this is what they treated cholera with. And we haven't experienced cholera in this generation, so we don't know what it is really. I'm going to give a, a read a description from a herbal um, medicinal book on what the cholera uh, epidemic was in the mid-1800s. The deadly Asiatic cholera reached Europe and then the United States from the Far East. It was transmitted in contaminated food and drinking water. The disease moved with frightful speed. The victim might be perfectly fit one evening and dead before breakfast the next day. The first symptoms were agonizing cramps in the stomach, a deathly chill, and incessant diarrhea so violent that only rice water was voided. The cholera victim died from dehydration, from loss of alkali, or from loss of potassium, usually from all three. Uh, the drugs that were given to the people here was just about the worst thing that they could have given them. There was an herbal treatment for cholera at the time, which included uh, large amounts of fluids given to them every 30 minutes for three days. This would keep them from dehydrating. The, the herbs that were used were oak bark, slippery elm bark, wild alum, and rose hips. On bronies, List. All of these.
these were growing at the edge of town. Uh, if Eric had sent a few of his people out to the edge of town to pick rose hips off the Carolina Rose, what we call Prairie Rose, um, Meadow Brew, Alum Root, Purple Cone Flower, they were all there. This is the purple cone flower you have in there. They eventually purchased this herb from Chicago. After the um, the all the bills that were paid that first year in '49 for medicinals, after that they started purchasing bulk herbs from various firms in Chicago. There was one last thing on this bill uh, after August 29th. It doesn't have a date, but it was a medical bill for root that would probably have been uh, Eric Jansen's niece who uh, gave birth to a baby boy in October. The doctor charged $20 for that. He was a good businessman. He charged them interest, 6% interest, when they didn't pay the bill on time. And then he made the effort to try to collect uh, a barter for his services. They gave him a pair of shoes valued at a dollar and a half. He had them make him a coat for five dollars, a pair of pants for a dollar fifty. He did get ten dollars in cash, and a skin coat for twenty-one dollars. But the rest of the bill, he forced them to sign a note for it to be paid uh, June tenth of eighteen fifty, charging six percent interest each month. On. This is one of the bills that show from one of the drug companies in Chicago. And on their bill, they show a sketch of, um, of the business. They were wholesale druggists at 94 Lake Street in Chicago. Another one was, uh, this one was dated in, in uh, 1856, uh, a list of uh, medicinal herbs as well as rose oil. They bought a lot of rose oil and rose water. It was considered antiseptic, and uh, rose oil was used in a lot of medications simply because it made the medicinal more palatable. You know, we see so many kids taking overdoses of medicine today. It's all flavored, orange or cherry, right? Back 50 years ago, well, yeah, it's not yeah, on that old. Back 50 years ago, you didn't worry about a kid getting into medicine. No kid in the right mind would take that vile tasting stuff because it was not cherry flavored. It was not orange flavored. It tasted horrible. It was made from the natural plant and it was pretty strong stuff. So they didn't worry about kids taking on uh, medication that they shouldn't be touching. Um, flip around bar. Got that? Yeah. Let's pass that around. This grew right out here in the forest, and um, they, they didn't realize it was available for a long time. They were buying at other places. They eventually went out and started harvesting slippery elm bark on their own. It's, it doesn't smell bad. A uh, number of medicinals are made from it, including cough drops today, natural cough drops. In it's very good for sore throats, and there is a blue, old blue dye that I haven't tried, but you can make an old blue dye from slippery elm bark. Uh, the rose hips they eventually gathered, they showed uh, a little of that. Some of the other things they purchased was sassafras. They bought that from Chicago. And of course, that was a spring chronic tea. Supposed to thin the blood, get you going. And acidity was a big one. They bought quite a bit of acidity. Any of anybody here old enough to remember acidity? Acidity couldn't be raised in the United States. I'm not 
sensitivity was used for children. It would protect them from just about everything you would think of. And I've talked to old pe older people <clears throat> who said they remember their mother is forcing them to wear acidity when they were going to a little one room school and each kid would, would wear an acidity bag. Now it would work provided only one person had the acidity bag. Because if you were wearing this, nobody would come anywhere near you. <laughs> and in the little one room school room, they had the young school marms. And a dead of winter, all these kids would come in. You want to remember, they're wearing wool clothes that haven't been washed all winter. And somebody's come in and started the fire up. But long about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, it gets pretty warm in there. And all these little kids sitting there with an acidity bag around their neck. So the acidity gets warmed up. And of course, these kids only get Saturday night baths, right? That's why so many school marms married the first dirt farmer that asked. <laughs> this would keep children from catching cold, flu, chicken pox, scarlet fever, anything that was contagious. Don't rub it against your clothing. The flavor sticks. Now, can you imagine 30, 30 kids in a classroom all wearing acidity bags? And this was preventive medicine in the 1850s. And the colonists ordered theirs from Chicago. One thing on the doctors uh, that treated the cholera victims, judgment really shouldn't be made on those doctors. They treated them the same way most doctors in the United States and Europe treated patients. A study done in 1853 stated that 55,000 people died of the cholera, and they analyzed that the doctors that treated them actually did more harm than they did good. There was someone in the area that was in Bishop Hill that really should have been of more help than what he was. And he's my favorite guy. His name was Victor Whitty. He wrote a book before he died, but he wrote it in Swedish. Um, and I spend about two hours at a time trying to translate some of this. I'm not doing a very good job. So if anyone can read Swedish fluently, I'd love to have you come to the week. There's lots in this book that I'd like to learn. Victor was an educated Swede. Um, he attended Latin school. <laughs> you really like that. The last person that gets this can take it home. <laughs> but um, please hang it out in the hallway until you leave. Don't leave it in the room. It will smell up the entire room. So the last person that gets it, please put it out in the hallway on one of the school books. <laughs> this drug comes from Pakistan. It's been shipped into the United States for many, many years. Mm -hmm. Good stuff, right? Uh, and here, here's the rosa. Yes. This is what the Indians would have told them to use. The Indians carried rose hips in little pouches. And when they traveled, they'd carry their own vitamins with them. Um, rose hips are very high in vitamin C. More vitamin C in those than what there is in oranges. But anyway, Victor attended, attended Latin school. He was also in the pharmaceutical studies for four years in Sweden. Um, but he was bored. He was a young man and he was adventurous. He was also a very good looking man, very intelligent looking. So he becomes sailor. 
sailed the Mediterranean area for quite some time. This is what it looks like. This is an older picture of him, so he's a good looking young man. And um, he decided he'd like to, to try the big ocean. Oh, yo won it. Yo is cured. <laughs> no, okay. Take that on that vicious dog. <laughs> but uh, he uh, finally got a job on, on a boat coming to the United States, and he, all he planned to do was sail. Uh, it was the boat that was wedged between two rocks that had the Swedes on board, and the Jan Knight sat in the bottom of the boat and prayed that God would deliver them, and he did. And the sailors were all certain that this group of Jansenites had prayed them back into existence, and Victor Whitting was very impressed by it. Uh, the next trip out, he came again with a group of Swedes, and he was their steward this time. They offered him a free ride on to Bishop Hill if he would stay in the United States. He was very impressed with the group that he was with, and so he came on this way, but he didn't travel well over land. He got sick in Chicago. They left him in Chicago, and the next group of immigrants that come through picked him up and brought him on down here. Um, this guy worked in half a dozen places, in pharmaceutical companies and in drugstores. He knew plants, he knew them live, he knew them in the laboratory. But he did not get on well with Eric Jansen. They fought continually. So he was here less than a year. He married a um, Katharina Chalk, C-H-A-L-L-M-A-N, anybody know her? She was a passer through. Uh, they left Bishop Hill, uh, and he took his bride to Galesburg, and he went on to the uh, gold fields in California with a group of Swedish Methodists from Victoria. They went broke in the gold fields, and he returned, uh, trying to decide what to do. He went to see Eric Shogren in Victoria, Illinois. He told. Eric, that he had an idea on a get-rich-quick plan. They would grow medicinal herbs in Victoria, load them on boats here, and send them to the Pleasant Hill Shaker community in Kentucky. The Shakers had developed such a tremendous trade that they couldn't fill all of their orders. And so they had put out bills all over the Midwest stating that if you wanted to grow herbs for them, they would accept them if they were quality dried herbs. Victor says, I'm a natural. I know all the stuff. And one statement that he made was, the herbs, the wild medicinal herbs, grow naturally in the wild in this region. He was talking about the Victoria and Bishop Hill area. He said, we can go out and just simply pick a great deal. They also plowed up some ground over near Victoria, <coughs> and, and they planted a great many herbs. They worked all year. This would be, believe me, this is very labor intensive. Uh, harvested their crop, dried it, took it to the Mississippi and put it on a boat. It was to go to St. Louis and then on to Cincinnati, just outside of Cincinnati. The boat sank. It's so sad because I've never heard of that early of a medicinal herb farm existing in Illinois, and it would have been great if we still had it, you know, if he could have gotten it going. Uh, the Bishop Hill people were a natural for that type of industry. They could have done it as well and as easily uh, as what the Shakers did, and they certainly had finer soil to work with to begin with. But that kind of put the skids to that. He took off and went to um, um, back to Victoria, back to Victoria, and became a Methodist Swedish Methodist minister. He was very successful in that venture. His wife traveled all over the world with him. At one point in time, they were sent back to Sweden uh, to preach the uh, Swedish Methodists <coughs> to the Swedes in Sweden. 
Uh, but Victor was in, Vic in Bishop Hill at the time of the cholera epidemic. He writes a little bit about it in his book. He maintains that there was a slogan that was <coughs> repeated from one week to the next. One day red, meaning having fever, in morning dead. And that people died. Uh, I think the first to die was a little six-year-old girl, uh, six-month-old baby girl. Uh, the second to die was a six-year-old girl. And then he says, after that, one after another of the adults. Um, a great many of them were out at LaGrange, and I found three different instances that imply that if people developed the cholera, they were put in wagons and taken out to LaGrange, almost as if it was an effort to quarantine out to old Dr. Falter, was it? Um, but Victor could have done a great deal for the community. He was educated. He had a lot of ability. But you had to believe in the religion to stay here. You had to believe in the dream, and you had to accept your share of the responsibility to make the three cent a day plan work. And Victor wasn't willing to do that. In order to make this work, it meant keeping all bills down. Uh, they were allotted so much clothing, but the food was the big thing. Um, a great many of the things that they grew was an effort to keep that overhead down to just practically nothing. This is a, is a recipe that I've never heard of before. I used to collect bread recipes. And I've gone through all of my shaker recipe books and the old pioneer books, and I haven't found anything that compares with it. They describe a meal of uh, the beef and, and several hogs were killed each week. Mush and pure milk was used extensively. But the bread was made of pumpkin meal and wheat flour. It was a wheaten pumpkin meal bread. This would be extremely unusual bread. They raised a lot of pumpkins. And I wonder if this recipe isn't specifically dealing with an overabundance of something and they weren't going to throw it out. With this concept in mind, I can envision Jonas Olsen going down to the kitchen and saying, hey girl, we got a problem. With the mill going, we get to keep one barrel of flour for every five barrels that we grind for anyone. We can sell that. It brings a good price. We can ship it out of here and sell it. But you're going to have to cut down on the amount of flour you're using. The old gals making the bread are saying, what do you want us to put in there? Wheat flour is wheat flour. That's what we're going to put in the bread. And one old gal says, well, what are we going to do with all of the dried pumpkin that we saved all fall? Because they weren't going to leave any in the field or throw it away. They had the caves. They could save a lot of stuff. They could really store away a lot of food in what became root cellars to them as they began to build. Jonah says, you take all that dried pumpkin down to the mill and have it ground. Same thing with cornmeal. Then start substituting one barrel of pumpkin meal for every two barrels of flour. So you're going one to three. That would have cut this down a little more. Would have raised that profit up. That gives them extra barrels, several extra barrels of flour and sell every week. The uh, food value would be tremendous. Pumpkin has a lot of food value to it. Would have been good for them. Uh, the gardens were large, 15 acres of potatoes. Of course, potatoes they were acquainted with in Sweden. 28 acres of vegetables. And 100 acres of Hungarian grass, whatever that was. The, the vegetable gardens included what they refer to as English herbs. That would be thyme, sage, and borage and perhaps dill and woodruff. They also raised uh, cabbage, and they had trouble with cabbage worms. In the um, 
um, Stoneberg papers at Knox, there was this recipe. To kill worms on cabbage, and this was written by a colonist who worked in the gardens, one tablespoonful of coal oil and one gallon of soap suds or sweet or sour milk sprinkled on the cabbage with force enough to get between the leaves will effectively kill the worms with one application. Repeat when first sign of worms appear. So that they, were, they were treating things to keep them from, uh, they weren't going to share it with others. Um, our garden of vegetables, even melons were planted southwest garden, the vegetable garden, southwest of the cemetery which the women had supervision over, which means the women did the work for uh, One Sunday afternoon, some people come into town, and a guy was sitting under the shade tree watching the women work in the gardens. Mm -hmm. And he sent a boy over to his wagon and said, bring me that gun kind of stuff. He brought it over, and it had melons in it. They don't specify whether it was cantaloupe or watermelon. I would guess probably watermelon. He cut the melon open and gave it to the boys, and they just loved it. And they shared it around with a few of the women in the garden, and the women said, don't eat those seeds, we're going to grow those. So after that, they grew melons, and uh, an ox boy boss also planted melon seed along the hedgerows. So they had all the melons they could want. So everyone in the village, this was quite a treat the following year, everyone had all the melons they wanted. And that was one of the few things that they got that was a treat, that they could eat as much of as they wanted. Um, so pumpkins, cabbage, all types of vegetables, uh, plus yellow peas. Great deal of split pea soup was made uh, any growling that was done over the, the food was concerned the fact that all too often they had yellow split pea soup, pumpkin wheat bread, milk, and small beer. Small beer made with hops. Hops is an herb. I can't find any place in the bill so far that, takes it, that shows that they bought hops. Therefore, they must have raised them themselves or gathered hops. There was hops uh, probably growing in the wild. They did eventually gather the slippery elm bark, and they traded some of it, sold some of it, but I, haven't, I don't have a list as to who they traded it to, whether it went to the, the shakers. Uh, the shakers were using a lot of it. Women from this area were sent to the Shakers um, to learn how to use a lot of the herbs for dyeing purposes. Jonas Olson's daughter was sent in uh, 53, spent three or four months there learning how to use the various Shaker herbs to dye fabric with. Uh, they made a tremendous amount of fabric. Uh, the flax industry. Flax is definitely an herb, and so that whole industry can be labeled herbal. When it comes to um, the booze they made, which was a small beer, this was included at every meal. They also made a brandy, uh, and it was called Old Number Six. In the hospital records, it shows that it was handed out as a medicinal. And it's been kind of a joke over the years that uh, a lot of people that like to drink too much went to the hospital each week and received their allotment of, of old number six. Um, brandy was considered one of the top, uh, the top use for fine brandy was in medicinal herbs. French brandy was the finest brandy. Most apple brandies with 40, 40 to 60 percent. French brandy was a premium brandy. And it could be anywhere from 90 to 96. It was considered a medicinal brandy. It was tough quality. 
And the fact that we don't know anything about this apple brandy other than the fact they called it number six. I believe there's a possibility that they at one point reached that big six number, which would have meant they had a premium quality brandy that they could sell on the bar market as a medicinal, thus bringing them a top price. Um, more examination of the orchard records which again are all written in Swedish, uh, but they do list uh, all the different types of apple trees that they grew. They grafted their own, um, and there are several words in there that imply that some trees were marked as special brandy trees. So they had the brewing facility here to make quality brandy, and there's a possibility that they did come up with that. Again, that would have been an item to have traded to the shakers. Um, decorative things in herbs. You know, you look at any pictures of, of these colonists, and, and you can pretty well tell there wasn't a lot of decorative anything that went on around here. One of the few things, that right after, especially after the cholera, um, Eric, who had escaped the cholera by uh, going to a Rock Island island, government island, uh, lost his wife that way, come back and said he had decided to uh, rescind the celibacy laws, therefore people could be married. And they married a group of 24 out in the woods, and he told them, okay, we're going to have a wedding. How many of you want to get married? We'll go out in the woods, we'll have a nice big wedding. Great, we're going to have a party. We're going to have a party in a long time. He said, no, remember the three cent plan. There's going to be no money spent for the big fancy wedding. You've had your clothing allotment for the year. We'll have the wedding right before a meal, so we can go in and sit down and have a meal. Uh, so that'll be a wedding meal. But there'll be nothing fancy. Some of the old gals said, oh, come on, Eric, we want to have a party. We've got to have something decorative. Well, he could come up with just one thing that wouldn't affect this plan. And that was the fact they could wear the traditional Swedish garb, which would have been vines, leaves, and whatever flowers were blooming at the time in the woods. So you have 12 beautiful brides lined up out in the woods, getting married, nothing but their regular street clothes and their, gar their Swedish garb on the day. Afterwards, they went to the um, mess hall and everybody ate lunch. Then he stands up and says, now, I'm going to assign new duties to the married couples. And they were assigned as nurses for the cholera patients out of Dr. Foster's near Oreo. Uh, some of them died before the week was out. This is another instance that says uh, the cholera patients who had been taken out <coughs> to Orion for the safety of the town, again implying People were loaded up during the cholera epidemic and removed from this area, at least at some point in time, when they were out into the LaGrange area in an effort to um, hold down all of the spread of the disease. There's a couple of other decorative things in Bishop Hill that I've been interested in ever since I moved up here. Any of you that send away four Wayside, White Flower Farm, um, any of the better quality plant books, if you notice they started out, <coughs> excuse me, just a few years ago showing a few old roses. It's, they were high priced, $30, $35 on some of them. In the last five years, that has skyrocketed to where now they're showing page after page of antique roses. This has become the new sweetheart of the plant world. Uh, I've been checking roses in Bishop Hill for several years because I thought a lot of them were very old. And I've brought my slides along the time. Um, these are all all but two, I think, are on private property. Put the lights down, they won't come all out. 
bring the lights down so you show them. I'm going to plug in. I guess so. These are old roses in Bishop Hill. I go out each spring. This one, poor baby, had been run over by lawnmowers and everything else. This was the only flower it produced. So now we've marked it and kind of protected it with, a, with some fencing until we can see what it'll come back and be. But it is an old rose. This is a nice one, and if it's the one with that so we think it is, that this rose would date back prior to 1830. It's a couple of the local ladies um, with an old rose in their yard. These two ladies say they remember, they're in the late 80s now, and when they were very young girls, that would be the early part of the 1900s, 1910 to 1915, they remember the west side of the colony church down that whole slope was solid with rose bushes. They don't know why they were there. This is an apothecary rose. This is Bishop Hill. This is a later rose, probably 1930s and it was out at the cemetery. This one is in the corner of the uh, colony church yard. Probably a that. That's a white one, big tall one. People in town are taking very good care. This is Father Hugo on the other side of the colony church next to the restroom. Again, this is one from the cemetery. Another father, Hugo, in another yard here in town. This is a beautiful, most delicate pink. Beautiful foliage on it. This is an old moth. Note the uh, mossy or hairy look to the buds. It's a very old pink moss rose. Probably um, um, another Rosa Monday, I believe. And this one we think is the old <coughs> apple coffee rose, apothecary rose. This is another view of a Roman moss rose. But these are, yeah, that's all, okay. Um, any of you that have old roses in your yard, please make note of them. And if you don't mind, I'd like to come in and record them. Um, I write down all the measurements and, and all the information I can get on them. Plus, uh, I take photographs and dry cuttings. Uh, I've recently joined a couple of organizations in the United States that this is, we do this only for one reason and that is to identify, find and identify and conserve old roses. Uh, there could be a bit of a connection here between the Shakers. The Shakers uh, raised a lot of roses. They made rose oil and rose water. Uh, this was a very important product in the 1800s because it was antiseptic. People uh, used it to bathe wounds. It was used in hospitals to bathe sick, feverish bodies. The rose oil was used to flavor the medicinals that tasted so terrible. Uh, Bishop Hill in the uh, 48 and 49 showed that they bought a lot of it. I haven't found that they bought it after that time period. Um, we first started visiting the Shakers in 1848, March of 1848. And we were in there every month 
anywhere from two to three people, and a lot of times women would go and stay for extended periods of time. Uh, and in each year after 1848, there was some woman in there at about the time those rose bushes at Pleasant Hill would have bloomed. They uh, planted them all along the streets. Uh, they were not allowed to smell them or pick them for adornment. They were a product from which they made herbal cures. And people were told that it was vain to admire the roses. Uh, anyone visiting there from here would have inquired about them, I would think, and once explained that this was to make rose oil and rose water, they would compare that with the bills that they were getting for this stuff. They were paying 65 cents a bottle and buying 12 to 24 bottles at a time uh, for use here in the colony. Um, the rose that uh, the Pleasant Hill Shakers grew is in Bishop Hill in, in the old yards. Um, the fact that the Burke twins said that it was on the west side of the colony church, if they chose to plant a rose here for that kind of cultivation, that would have been an ideal spot for it. It would have been very close to the brewery, which is where the blooms would have gone to have been distilled into rose water or into rose oil. It would have been a good soft slope, which would have meant good drainage and ideal place to plant roses. Further on down the hill would not have been a good place. Um, I'll keep looking uh, with the possibility of finding more on that. We exchanged an awful lot with the Shakers. Uh, they gave us a tremendous amount of technology. In return, they stole a few Swedes. They were very impressed with the Swedes. In fact, uh, they did talk, uh, Andrew Bloomberg did leave here and took his family and, and uh, lived with the Shakers. He was very successful with the Shakers. He was one of their main missionaries. And they sent him back here a number of times, and each time he came back, he usually took two or three Swedes back to Pleasant Hill with him. Uh, at the end of uh, the Civil War, the Shakers uh, sent a number of missionaries to Sweden to try to convert Swedes to Shaker and to bring them back to Pleasant Hill Colony, all because they were so impressed with the Swedes here. So um, we, we got a lot from them too. Uh, some of the, some of the, uh, the fine cattle industries that we had, our broom corn industry come from the Shakers. Our cattle come from the Shakers. Uh, there are pedigrees uh, lines of the Durham cattle that were raised by uh, this colony, and all of their bloodlines traced back to the Shakers. And there are records of the Shakers coming here um, for cattle sales. They would bring cattle down here and, and have a cattle sale and sell to the neighbors as well as to the Bishop Hill colony. In return, they got all of our wagons. Now we don't have any. Um, a lot of technology on dyes, on weaving, um, and all of the ideas for celibacy came from the Pleasant Hill Shakers. So uh, they, they learned the hard way. If they had talked to the Indians, they'd have saved some money on bills, and they'd have saved some sweets. Uh, but everyone was afraid of Indians, so we didn't talk to the Indians. They spent a little time with uh, the people out at Red Oak, and from that, they learned a great deal. They learned how to dry fruits, how to dry pumpkins, uh, and how to pick up on the, the pioneer or the Indian food, uh, the Indian corn. Indian corn was grown here. Uh, that, that what they would have gotten from uh, the Red Oak group. But uh, they learned slow. We built the hospital, and, and they come up with their own drugs and adequate drugs. 
but only after a couple really bad experiences and, and lost a great many lives. I think the more I study the Swedes, the more I can relate to them and the more admiration. I don't always agree with the uh, religious concepts, but the basic values of the colonists that came here. They were beautiful people. They come from one of the best lines of uh, bloodlines of human beings on the earth. Um, the fact that they they left, I've heard people make comment that um, anyone that was smart enough to realize what was going on left. Um, I'm not at all sure of that. I think uh, a great many of them did believe in this dream, and they stayed for a long time in an effort to try to make it work. Um, there's a lot of information in the archives uh, with the Bishop Hill Heritage Association that have never been touched. A lot has never been translated. There's tremendous amounts of information in the archives at Knox College. On the second floor, they have a a new area for their archives there. And they have this peculiar sensation of heat from the floor to the ceiling, which you won't find in the archives at Bishop Hill Heritage Association. Um, Swenson Center in the cities has a lot of information. But just from what little bit I've seen in the archives here, it's a shame that it hasn't been touched, that more people aren't interested in it, and that more people aren't spending time in it. If you, if you don't have a particular line of interest and you have a, a cold winter day when uh, you don't have anything else to do, you will find a point of interest in those archives. Uh, Jan Stevens is always helpful in helping you dig through boxes to find what you're interested in. As the state and federal government become more and more absorbed in trying to maintain an economy in this country, uh, we're going to see less and less support from the state and federal government. And maybe that's better. It's going to make each of us a little more responsible for the heritage that is left here for us. It's our responsibility to be interested enough to save it. Uh, the heritage welcomes your interest, and I'm sure the state does too. Um, anyone that can translate would be very valuable. Otherwise, if you just want to go in and read the English, this is worthwhile. And not everyone can donate money to organizations or causes, but you can donate your own interest and your own time. And I hope some of you will consider spending a little time with the Heritage Association. Uh, I want to thank Heritage for inviting me. And don't forget, we have uh, what, two? We have um, three more. Three more. Um, Phil Deach, Sunday, March 3rd. Do you have the right one for uh, Kirsten on uh, Saturday, April 6th? Saturday, we April. have Sunday marked out, so we have Saturday, April 6th at 2 o'clock at the Heritage Museum. <coughs> this is a lady that lives in California. Uh, she's been to Sweden. She's into um, the milkmaids and how, how they work that in Sweden, and I think it'd be very interesting to compare it with how the wor uh, milkmaids worked here. Um, also, any of you that are interested in herbs, uh, we'll have an herb clinic on how to grow herbs, how to do herb gardening in the Blacksmith Building the last Saturday and Sunday of April. Um, the greenhouse is full of herb plants, and hope to be bursting at the seams by that time. Uh, any of you interested in growing herbs are welcome to come in for that. Mm -hmm. You're in, good, good, write it down so you don't forget it. I'll send you a card. Um, and we have a, one other, let's see, Wade Nystrom, blacksmithing in Bishop Hill Colony, Sunday, April 7th at two o'clock, and that's at the Heritage Museum, Colonies People Building. Okay. Anybody have any comments? Uh, anybody have any old roses in their backyard that I don't know about yet? Anyone in town? Has anyone ever heard of pumpkin meal wheat? <coughs> ever seen a recipe for it? 
I think it's native to Bishop Hill. I'm drying pumpkin. I'm going to try it. It'll be interesting. There's several shaker recipes that are wheat and um, cornmeal. Right. So I thought we'd try just transferring and, and try and use pumpkin meal and uh, see how it tasted. It'd be a very nutritious food. Pumpkin would uh, would give plenty of nutrition to it. Okay, anybody else have any comments or questions? Did the bread recipes have yeast in them? Yes, this would have been a, a start of yeast. Mm -hmm. It would have, yeah, yeah. It was no heart. It wasn't like a heart attack. What they described is not a heart attack. Mm -hmm. okay. Anybody else? Okay, I think we still have coffee left. Yeah. Thanks very much to Berla Hunter. Thanks very much for all of you for coming. Uh, I also need to thank the Illinois Arts Council, a state agency, and the National Endowment for the Arts for funding this lecture series. Um, we hope you'll come next Sunday, and we hope you'll come to um, either or both of the talks on the premier programming weekend of April 6th and 7th. Kirsten Brorson will be talking about the music and folk traditions of the dairy maids of the province of Dalarna. Um, there were some of those traditions that were transplanted here, um, and I'm sure that she'll be interested in seeing what's here to expand her knowledge. Um, you're welcome to coffee and your second dessert. <laughs>